Good morning to all of you who are joining us online this morning. Let us uh, continue to, pr to pray for an end to this pandemic, uh, for the effectiveness of the vaccine, and uh, for an opportunity for us to return to a normal uh, worship um, services and a normal schedule, we pray. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. I want to speak this morning from this uh, short epistle reading from um, First Timothy. We just celebrated the Feast of St. Timothy on uh, Friday, my name day. Timothy was a young bishop of the church in the great Asia Minor, city, Asia Minor city of Ephesus. And today's epistle reading is from the Apostle Paul's first letter to him. In this reading, the Apostle makes a very interesting statement about himself. In Greek, he says this, Christos Jesus, ethin istron cosmon amartolus sose, on protos imiego. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom, whom I am the first, or the foremost. Really. Interestingly, I've, I've been having a, a, a running conversation with another member um, of the church about this verse. Um, he has come to, to orthodoxy in recent years and is an adult and, and very astute. And he thinks about the things he reads a lot and he thinks about the things he reads. And one of the verses that has really strikes him is this verse. How can the apostle refer to himself as the foremost of sinners? And I'll come to it in a few minutes. How can I do that? The apostle Paul, if he's the worst of sinners, where does that leave the rest of us? I'm sure there's some people in our society now who'd, who would take pride in that. You know, first of sinners, all right, number one. No, not for us. What can we say about this statement? Is this just the Apostle Paul being rhetorical? In part, this is certainly rhetorical. He means for his hearers to read it, to hear it that way. He's specifically saying that he is, in a word, no better than anyone else. We're all sinners. This is the same Apostle Paul who tells the Corinthians and the Philippians to be imitators of me, who refers to himself as their spiritual father. At the same time, the Apostle also remembers his sinful past. He wasn't a drunkard, or he was not sexually immoral, or a thief, or a liar. He was a very religious man, but he was a religious zealot. He persecuted the Church of Christ. When the Lord appears to him on the road to Damascus, he tells Paul, Saul, Shaul, at the time, that Saul is persecuting him. Perhaps Saul the zealot was also responsible for the death of some Christians. Maybe he had blood on his hands. He was fighting against God, against his own Messiah, God's Son. The apostle has a profound profound appreciation of God's mercy. God had mercy on me, he writes several times, and he means it because he knows he deserved something else. How interesting that we remember the apostles' words every time we celebrate the divine liturgy, every time we read the prayers of preparation for Holy Communion. Pistevo kirio kiemologo otisi i alithosho Christos, o ios tu theu tu zondos, o elthon iston cosmon amartolus sose on protos i mi ego. I believe and confess, O Lord, that you are truly the Christ, the Son of the living God, who came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the first. We repeat his words. Of course, the variation, the translations vary, you know, the chief of sinners, the foremost of sinners, whatever. What do we mean when we pray these words? Am I somehow undermining any positive view of myself? Am I, as a Christian, allowed to feel good about myself at all? What's the basis of my self-esteem? If I do have any self-esteem, if I can have self-esteem and still be a Christian, we know that anything that impacts my basic view of myself is very important. 
Psychologists would, I think, pretty much agree that we as human beings act in accordance with our self-image. If I look at myself with confidence or with fear and insecurity, that's going to affect how I deal with people. It's going to affect my whole life. If I live with guilt, that will affect me. If I have no guilt for my action, if I, if I feel no responsibility for my action, that will also greatly affect my behavior. A couple of observations about this. Let us not forget that we believe that human nature is fundamentally good. God finishes his creation in the great sweeping mythic panorama of Genesis and says what? It is good. It's good. The image of God is still very much present in us. We've not lost that. Our anthropology, our theology about the nature of humanity is a bit different from Western Christianity, a bit different from what you'll typically hear on the television or radio. Our theology does not include inherited guilt. We believe that this is actually a heretical belief. Inheriting guilt means that we're born condemned. We don't believe this. What we inherit from our forefathers is death, an evil world system in turmoil, and a disordered human nature that tends towards sin. But regardless of what we inherit or don't inherit, we're all in fact sinners. We all violate God's expectations in thought, word, and deed. So where do we find our self-worth? Our holy tradition encourages us to walk a very fine line, a narrow path. I need to remember that I'm a sinner so that I can be humble and repentant I need to remember my sins, but not in detail. I must not go back and relive those things. I need to leave those events behind. And so we practice confession. In our tradition, there's no need to live in guilt. And by the way, guilt is a very good thing, but only if it drives you to repentance. Guilt is not a good long-term motivation. It's not good to live in guilt. People ask, can I confess my sins directly to God? And the answer, of course, is yes. Should I come and participate in confession? And the answer, of course, is what? Yes. Here's a question. Where does my value as a person, as a human being, come from? As moderns, I think we suspect that we just develop a sense of self-worth as we grow up but I don't do this well by myself. I can only develop a sense of who I am in relation to other people. If you're truly Greek, you know the first of the ancient Delphic maxims. What was it? Gnothi safto, classical Greek. Know yourself. Hmm. Can I know myself? This is foundational for a number of reasons but it's also problematic. No one can be objective about himself or herself. As a Christian, I know that I can only find my true essential self-identity and self-worth in relationship to God. I'm made for a relationship with God. God knows me and loves me more than I can even imagine. God sees me as I really am, and he always considers me worth saving. He gave his only son to save me. And if God evaluates me and he, he disapproves of me, or if he approves of me and my actions, then what I'm doing is cosmically right or wrong. Many of you know Father David Fonts. Father David is an Orthodox priest, now retired. He was also a practicing licensed psychologist for many years. A few years ago, he wrote a book called In the Eyes of Your Creator on just this topic how we can find self-worth as Christians, bookstore, Amazon. At the same time, the scriptures in our tradition warn me repeatedly against pride. I need to be humble and remember that if I'm being saved, if I'm being transformed, it is because God takes the initiative in this. Humility is the invitation to God's grace. It's the door to transformation. What salt is for food, wrote Isaac the Syrian, humility is for every virtue. To acquire it, a man must always think of himself with contrition, self-belittlement, 
and painful self-knowledge. And if we acquire it, humility, it will make us sons of God. St. Isaac also wrote that humility is the garment of the deity. He argued that just as Jesus humbled himself to take on human form, so we, when we take on humility, become clothed with Christ. St. Augustine puts it succinctly, the whole of the Christian religion is humility. Let us return to the Apostle Paul's disturbing words. To see ourselves as the chief sinner is to look candidly at ourselves before God. It is to be humble. It's to see our sins for the terrible, ugly things that they are. It is to admit as we stand before the holy altar that we've been in league with the enemy and that we've been traitors to the cause of Christ. In this sense, recognizing and proclaiming that I am the first of sinners, I am the foremost, is not an exercise in mock humility, but rather it's an honest reflection of how I see the gravity of my own sins before God. This self-awareness leads us like the blind man in the gospel today to cry out to the Lord, Lord, have mercy on me. To conclude, as Christians, our goal in this life is not to develop self-esteem. It's not. Working on our self-esteem is to become preoccupied with ourselves, or for most of us, more preoccupied with ourselves than we already are. Our key to our own healthy self-identity, our personhood, if you will, is to become less preoccupied with ourselves and more preoccupied with the Lord Jesus Christ. It is to love and not seek to be loved because I believe that God already loves me. It is to some degree to forget about ourselves. St. Hermit of Alaska wrote this, If we love someone, we always think of him, strive to please him day and night. Our hearts are occupied with him. It is, is it thus that you love God? Do you often turn to him? Do you always think of him? Do you always pray to him and fulfill his holy commandments? For our good, for our happiness, at least let us make a promise to ourselves that from this day, from this hour, from this minute, we will strive to love God above all and fulfill his holy will. If we become preoccupied with the Lord Jesus Christ, what will happen? We will be filled with his grace and his love. We will begin to understand how much God loves us and how important we are to him. So let us truly repent and be humble before God. Let us con confess our sinfulness and our unworthiness to him. Let us love God who loves us. Let us accept his love for us. God's love for us and our love for him will bring us to God, to who he is, and also to who we truly are and who we are meant to be and who we are destined to become. Amen.